Good evening, everybody, and welcome to IF Oxford. It's lovely to see so many of you joining us here tonight on this webinar. My name's Cathy, I am the festival manager, and I would like to warmly welcome everyone tonight. But let's move on to tonight's event, The Art of Fusion in Conversation. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce tonight Ella Ashdown from the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And Ella works in the communications team, but also has a great interest in art. And tonight's event is all about the fusion between art and science. So I will now hand over to Ella to take us through tonight's event. Thank you, Cathy. It's so nice to be able to do another event uh, with IF Oxford. Uh, for those of you who may not know, we did an event like this last year talking about the similarities between art and science. And we're doing uh, another one this year, focusing more on the similarities between sculpting and engineering. All fantastic. Lovely. So welcome to uh, the Art of Fusion in Conversation. Uh, as Cathy said, my name is Ella. I'll give introductions to my uh, panellists in just a moment. So tonight we are going to be talking, as I said, about the similarities between art and science and focusing more on sculpting and engineering. Uh, this evening and perhaps show you that there's more similarities between the two than you may initially have thought. We've got a lot to get through tonight. We're also going to be revealing a commission sculpture from our guest, Andrea Brewer, uh, which was commissioned for the UK Atomic Energy Authority. So we'll be revealing that artwork to you uh, throughout the course of the evening. And we'll also be announcing the winners of the art competition that's run over the summer by the same name, The Art of Fusion which was an opportunity for the public to show us their interpretation of fusion energy with a focus this year on sustainability. So without further ado, I shall click to my next screen. There we go, it's working, that's good. Uh, so I'm Ella Ashdown, I work in the communications team as a communications assistant for the UK AEA, and my background is in literature. Joining me as well from the UK AEA is Seo Adebonyon, who is a graduate remote handling operations engineer uh, with a background in robotics. Hey, Sayo. <laughs> and last but not least is Andrea Brewer, who from uh, ABC Ceramics, who is a ceramic artist and sculptor uh, with a background in ceramics, surprisingly. <laughs> so I thought I'd just level the playing field and make sure that we're all on the same page as to what fusion is and what the UK Atomic Energy Authority actually do. So it's going to be a whistle-stop tour because I want to be give as much time to the uh, discussion as possible. But if there's anything that I mentioned and you want to ask questions about it, please do put them in the, in the Q&A. Um, so what is fusion? Fusion is essentially star power. It's the process that powers the sun. Uh, and in order for fusion to happen, you first need to have a plasma. So plasma is the fourth state of matter. So you have a solid, a liquid, a gas, and then a plasma. Now, in order to create a plasma, you need to take your gas, which is essentially atoms composed of positively charged, a positively charged nucleus and an electron. And what makes the nucleus positively charged is the proton. So to get to the plasma state, you have to heat up the gas to an extreme temperature until the nucleus and the electron are separated, creating a plasma. Um, and this means that the plasma is ionized which means it can be controlled using a magnetic force, which is relevant uh, to something I'll mention a bit later on with our fusion machine. But in order to actually make fusion occur when you've got your plasma, you need to get these positively charged protons to, for want of a better word, fuse together. But if you've ever played with magnets, which I'm sure many of you have, you'll know that forcing two positives together is actually quite difficult because they naturally repel each other, a bit like this adorable cartoon. Um, so what we need to do is heat the plasma to such an extreme condition that it overcomes this natural repulsion and they uh, fuse together. And when that happens, it creates a huge amount of energy, which the UK Atomic Energy Authority are researching into how we can take that energy and use it to, uh, to supply energy uh, for our needs. So if I go to my next slide. There we go. So this is the site in South Oxfordshire, where the UK Atomic Energy Authority are based. 
Um, and as you can imagine, we do a lot of research on site. Uh, it's not just plasma physics. We also do materials uh, research, find out what materials are best to use in these machines. Uh, but we also do uh, robotics uh, research into remote handling so that we can fix the machine without having to send people inside. Uh, and that is done at our department called RACE, which is Remote Applications in Challenging Environments. And uh, Seo can tell us a little bit more about that when we get into this, the discussion. So the main machine that we have on site is called JET, which stands for the Joint European Taurus, uh, which is uh, the, the world's largest fusion machine currently. Um, and it is hosted by the UK on behalf of Eurofusion. It's housed in this rather lovely building here. So this is what the machine looks like. And um, it's sort of made of like a donut shaped chamber, which is uh, toroidal and it's called a torus. Um, and the machine itself is called a tokamak, which is a Russian acronym meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. So this means that once the plasma is inside the chamber, we can then control it and put it into the, the places that we want it to be using a magnetic field, uh, which surrounds the chamber. So this is a, a, a rather nice clean picture of the machine. This is what it actually looks like. It's, <laughs> it's a little bit more messy, um, but that is because there's lots of diagnostics equipment uh, going in and out of it so that we can collect as much data from it as possible. Um, and that reason being is that JET is first and foremost an experiment. So it's not something that's putting out power. It's something that we're, we're learning a lot from. So that's why there's so much diagnostics equipment uh, surrounding it. I'll show you a quick picture of the inside. So this is what the actual inside of the machine looks like. On the uh, left, you'll see when it's all sort of, when it's shut down as it were, if you were to just open the doors and have a look at it. Um, and it's all very, uh, very futuristic and shiny. And um, on the right, you'll see a picture which looks a bit blurred. It looks like it might have been edited in some way, but it's actually a picture of what the inside of the machine looks like when we're running an experiment. And the pinky purple hue that you can see is the actual color of the plasma, which is quite beautiful in my opinion. Now, I appreciate that was a whistle stop tour. Um, so if you do have questions, please do put them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them um, at the end when we've, when we've had a, a bit of a discussion. So if we, we might even answer your questions during that time. So I'll remind you now of who is joining me, it's Seo and Andrea. And um, I thought what we'd do first, I'll just hand over to them to, uh, to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail. But Seo, I thought we'd start with you. Um, I thought you could tell us a little bit about the, what inspired your decision to get into robotics. Like it's quite a niche subject. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, it is. Um, hi, everyone. I am Seo Adebayo. I am a graduate remote handling operations engineer. And so, yeah, my background in robotics, it, well, it wasn't anything special. I really, okay, when I was younger, I wanted to be um, an aeronautical engineer or a pilot because I love space, I love flying, it's cool to fly. I got an airplane <laughs> once. Um, but then, where I come from, in my country, Nigeria, there wasn't a lot of schools offering aeronautic engineering or piloting, and it was so expensive to um, go into those kind of courses. And so I decided to go into mechatronics engineering. And so during the course of my study, that is when I started learning about robots and manipulators, you know, cool things. And then suddenly, suddenly I started to fall in love with the robotics. And um, I went ahead to do a master's in robotics. And yep, I'm here today. So yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> I think that's great though. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's similar as to how I got into it, this role is that it's, it's those opportunities you see in your sort of peripheral that you think, oh, that actually looks like quite an interesting thing to explore. And it, it can lead you to some really interesting places, a bit like a lovely event at If Oxford. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah true. <laughs> Andrea, I thought you could uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about how you got into ceramics. Hello, everyone. Um, well, yeah, again, it's another sort of accidental thing, really. Um, I didn't, I've always been a keen sort of maker as a child, but and I, but when it came to sort of high school, I didn't really enjoy art particularly. 
Um, and it was only after I'd completed a degree in primary school teaching, um, and at which point I decided <laughs> at the end of it, I wasn't going to go into teaching, that um, I signed up to a ceramics adult um, evening class uh, just while I was trying to figure out what to do and loved it and kind of kept my hand in doing sort of evening classes. Um, and then a couple of years later, I had the opportunity to do a sitting gills um, qualification in it. Um, but really, that was just my love of clay and sculpting kind of was born in that in, a, in that way. And I started to sort of produce work and, and sell it. But it's really been a sideline until I was recently in, in 2019 able to sort of launch AB Ceramics more formally um, and start to be a commissioned artist. Ah, yeah, so it really is quite similar, actually, to the way that, uh, that Sarah got into to, to her profession as well. It is those little opportunities that you just... Uh, you don't think that are going to arise and then they do. Well, while we're on the subject of uh, your art and getting into uh, ceramics, I thought it would be a good time for us to reveal the amazing piece of work that we commissioned from you that you've uh, created for us. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me introduce you to the lovely uh, sculpture, which has been named Nucleus, which is here. And I think it's, it's just, beautiful I think there's so many similarities between this and it perfectly um, encapsulates all the work that we do at UK AEA and you know even the shape and the structure is just it's so it's so apt to the tokamak and the toroidal shape of, of the fusion machine. Um, we had you on site to have a little uh, look around and uh, a little tour of the facilities. I thought you could just talk us through a bit of the inspiration for the for the piece. Yes, I mean it was it was great to just um, come and see uh, the facility and be and see the images of the machine. I mean you can see very much that um, you know it was the actual machine itself and the the creation of the plasma creating a, a star on Earth is is the sort of analogy that it's been described as, which is sort of um, I've kind of drawn my uh, my sort of inspiration from but it was just great to see all of the different sort of combinations of different departments that all feed in so there was the ro robotic side there was the the, the fusion the, the running of the machine all of the different aspects um, that are working together and also the fact that this is you know an incredibly an international project a collaboration around the world um, and mm -hmm. so I think that was really uh, what, and, and I love also the magnetic side of it too so I think I was um, I was quite inspired by how that how that worked um, yeah, Absolutely. but it's been a lovely thing to have met to meet um, the scientists, and it's made me um, kind of really look into the science of ceramics as well, which um, I didn't fully appreciate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've well, I've got some more pictures of your your other work on the next slide, and it's interesting how you say you know the the sort of fusion of of science and art because I think a lot of your work, I think we'll come back to to this image in just a moment, but a lot of your work does does have a lot of scientific influence into it doesn't it you were saying mm -hmm. that um, there is a lot that goes into it. it's not just thinking of something and then making it there's a process you have to go through definitely um I think that you know I mean you can see that I'm sort of obsessed by the sort of spiral form um, but I w one of the things was I you know in my youth I did want to be a scientist but I found that when I did take I opted to take all three sciences in my third year at school and found that uh, I wasn't as good at physics and chemistry as I'd hoped. So um, I kind of scrapped that idea. But it's it still, it was lovely when I did discover ceramics that it kind of really, um, it was a, uh, an activity I could do that combined my love of creativity and with, with a lot of sort of science and alchemy involved in the process. Um, so even though I'm not really a, a scientist when I do it, I don't fully comprehend what's going on on, you know, in the deeper scientific level. It's got so much scope for experimentation. Um, but there's, there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of science involved in how you manage the material, um, you know, even yeah. in its raw form, um, when it's, you know, uh, at the, the stage of 
of plasticity that you're working with. So it needs you need to know how how long to let it dry and so that it can self-support as you're building it. But you also have to think about the design and how it's going to survive the firing, um, you know, so it doesn't slump or explode or anything in the kiln. So there are lots of sort of problem solving and design um, questions to answer when you're constructing a piece. So in that sense, there is a kind of an engineering sort of um, process involved. Absolutely. I think as well, you were saying about how there's a lot of a thought that goes into the, the materials and you've got to make sure that it's going to survive in, in the kiln and what's going to happen to it. Is it going to, is it going to be okay in the environment you're putting it into? In terms of, uh, of, of putting something into an environment which you need to make sure it's going to survive in. So I thought you could tell us, first of all, what this piece of equipment is. And uh, secondly, so the similarities between, you know, having to think about what we're doing when we're putting a machine or designing a machine like this into a fusion machine to, uh, to help robotically maintain it. So please do introduce us to, uh, to Mascot. Okay, so yeah, this is the Mascot. This is what we use. This is the robot a manipulator that we use to maintain the jet vessel and basically my day-to-day -day job is to operate this in the jet vessel <laughs> yeah. um and so yeah during the period um when during the period of the shutdown when the vessel when yeah the vessel is not running experiments um we have a maintenance period and that is when we send mascot into the jet vessel and so it's a two-armed manipulator and on the grips, you can see it has something like a screwdriver, basically. Um, and, and with that and other tools, we're able to maintain the jet vessel. But for it to go into the jet vessel, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, there is a lot of offline um, or in the office um, procedures and sequences, stages and steps that has to go through. And of course, we have to make sure that the equipment is actually suitable to go into the vessel. And you can see a bit of gaiters that we put on the on the mascot. So they also provide like safety to the mascot to ensure that um, nothing happens to the mascot while it's in um, it's in the vessel. And um, while we're creating the sequences um, or steps of operation, there are it's things like you know um, um, move the mascot, pick up something, drop something. Um, ensure that this thing is is tightly um is tightly bolted or tightly fixed you know kind of steps like that to ensure that the procedures that we're going through or what we want to achieve in the vessel is achieved safely um making sure that everything goes goes by safe and i'm sure with art and with making this culture um there is also like procedures or steps that has to be followed in order to achieve the like end product basically yeah that's a really good point yeah yeah, well, yes, definitely. I mean, there's the, you know, as somebody has said in the chat, you know, the chemistry and the the, the science that goes on, um, the, the alchemy, as I like to call it, in the kiln is really fascinating with ceramics, but there are lots of different stages. So you have your clay in the raw form, and then you're, you're constructing a piece, um, and, you know, you need to work with it either in its fully wet plastic state or, or it might be that you need to also let it dry into leather hard state for it to be able to support itself. And once you've finally finished your construction and you've made sure that it's going to fit in the kiln and it's going to be able to sit safely in the kiln to fire and that it will self-support and not slump, um, you then have to let it dry completely to a bone dry state. Um, because you can't and and in heating it up and cooling it down that has to be done very gradually because the process it has to lose still more moisture and if that's lost too quickly then it will your piece can explode in the kiln um, so you can and, and but many of your sort of um, the, the the best sort of problem solving and the best learning comes from many of those kind of mistakes <laughs> Uh, you know, those uh, spectacular mistakes in the kiln, you learn a lot about what not to do the next time and, and understand a lot more about how the material works. And uh, so it's fascinating, um, a, a really interesting process. Um, yeah, I thought it was um, it was really interesting when we were having our chat beforehand. Um, so this picture here, I hope you can see my laser pointer. Um, this, I'm sure Sarah can tell us a little bit more about the the, the arm that's attached to this uh, little version of mascot here. But the, um, 
and again, so you can you can go into more detail than I can, but the clearance that you have between the, the walls and getting mascot into the machine is quite small, isn't it? How many centimeters is it? Or? Yeah, it's like 30 mil. So it's it's a really tight fit. <sighs> to get mascot into the vessel yeah quite a delicate operation to make sure that you're not going to tap the sides which I thought was quite um apt and and a happy coincidence when we uh spoke Andrea about the um the the metal structure around your piece and about trying to fit the the heart of it into it was it um Mm. I think you mentioned that it it, it didn't fit initially is that right (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, this this was the challenge for me for this, because normally if I'm just making a piece, the only thing I have to think about is that it has to fit into the kiln. Whereas because I was working with um, a, a, a blacksmith who was building the steel sphere, I knew that I had a limited space at the bottom that I would that the ceramic piece would go through. And I was working with um, a set mold to make the initial sphere that I then built the fins onto. So as I was making, I had a, I'd cut a template out. And so I was trying very much to see that it would fit. But I know I knew that there would be shrinkage, but I didn't know the exact percentage. Um, so I was just hoping against hope that it would <laughs> shrink enough in the final glaze firing so that it would fit in the bottom. So it was a bit nerve wracking, but luckily, yeah, when it, when I, before it was glazed, it didn't completely fit snugly through that piece. But as soon as it had come out after the glaze firing, it did and, and it fitted perfectly. So that was a huge relief to me. <laughs> I don't normally have to work with such fine sort of, um, um such fine measurements <laughs> yeah yeah I imagine that's that's quite a, a stress to add to it um, <laughs> interesting as well that you said that obviously you worked with the with the blacksmith to create the metal structure mm. around the side you know it's such a quite a collaborative process um which is is interesting but as you know the the, the way that we operate mascot um again has to be a very collaborative process not just Sayo sat there on her own, like get, getting this machine ready. Like, how, how many people does it take, so to, to actually operate mascot or, or um, get it ready to go in the vessel? Well, quite a few people. <laughs> when we're in actual operation, there are like five people, and then we have like maintenance people. Um, oh, sorry, two. Yeah, two related people on the side. And from the picture, you can see it's, it's just one person that actually operates mascot. But then there's someone else on the side that reads out the instruction. There's somebody else that controls the boom that the mascot is handed and um, mounted to. The boom, and, this big arm here. Yeah, that big one here. <laughs> there's someone else controlling that. And we do have another boom that carries the tools and um, yeah, task module, whatever is needed, whatever tools are needed for mascot. So there is another boom not shown shown in this picture that carries so there's somebody else operating that so yeah quite a lot quite a lot yeah (laughs) so um what shall we move well yeah so in terms of you know we've said that it's a, a collaborative process to get the machine ready to go into the other machine um there must be quite a lot of training involved in being able to actually control the machine control mascot and the skills and training involved must be quite intense, I would imagine. Like, what sort of training do you need to go through in order to actually um, be able to control mascot? Yeah, it takes, like, to learn how to do the whole process of, of going into the vessel and do the task, it takes about six months. Um, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's so <laughs> But the first three months, anyway, you're learning how to operate mascot, how to operate the booms. And then the rest three months, you're you're actually learning in your office how to um, create a sequence of actions or tasks that have to be carried out. Um, So, yeah, like three months are hands on and three months are sort of like in the office. Um, But, yeah, it takes (laughs) quite a bit of training. And um, while you're training, you know things like attention to detail um how to follow procedures how to work as a team um technical skills you know you learn so much and and gain a lot of skills um while while learning to operate the mascot yeah 
Yeah, six months. Gosh, that's a long time. <laughs> I imagine as well as if you're putting something. Um, so we, I, I, I failed to mention earlier. Actually, we do have a training vessel, uh, which is sort of a mock-up of the actual fusion machine. So of Jet, there's a training vessel called the IVTF, uh, the In Vessel Training Facility, which is, uh, I imagine, where you do all of your training and learning. Um, but you must have to, you know, if something goes wrong, God forbid you'd have to sort of think on your feet a little bit. And I imagine that's that's sort of similar to the way that um, you would construct your ceramics, Andrea, in the sense that if, you know, you put it into the kiln, you realise that, I don't know, something or it, or it doesn't fit, as you were saying earlier, trying to come up with creative solutions to problems that arise must be quite quite a common occurrence in, in art and science. Well, definitely. Uh, certainly, I can say that, you know, as I've said, you learn the most from the mistakes that you make. And, and while I have reached a certain point with the clay that I use and the glaze recipe that I use to know that I can kind of get some fairly reliable results, there will always be certain things that are unexpected. Um, you know, the piece that breaks off or the thing that doesn't quite work. I mean, as a kind of correlation, actually, when I was cutting the sections out of the sculpture, um, it turned out that, the, that there was it was luckily there was just one hole that was big enough for me to just get my hand in in the same way as the you know, mascot went into the, you know, <laughs> just just it was literally just the right size so that I could get in there to glaze to apply the glaze <laughs> before it went yeah. into the firing so that was a happy coincidence but you know had that had it shrunk too much for me to get my hand in, then I would have had to have used some other means uh, uh, of, of, of achieving that goal. But yes, there's a lot of problem solving involved with it, I think. Um, and because there's so, you know, with ceramics, there are so many um, techniques, firing techniques, glazing techniques, different, gla uh, different construction techniques, the, the possibilities are endless. So there's just, there's, there's so much experimentation that can be done. Um, but then, then there's always a higher risk factor of of missed or failures. The more experimental you are, but um, yeah. but that's the I thing. Think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting actually that um, Sayo was saying there's so many processes you have to follow, almost like following a recipe to mm -hmm. make sure that you're setting up the the mascot ready to to go in and do some some maintenance. But also in the sense that you know you must have to follow a procedure with ceramics as well you know you start with your your base product and then you move along in a certain order you know you probably have to do it in a in a in, a, in an order rather than um start from one point and, and end up in another yeah well definitely so obviously you know you'll, you'll build your piece you'll let that dry um you'll bisque fire it up to just a thousand degrees initially um which creates the ceramic and makes it um more stable for you to work with but it's still porous so that then when you apply the liquid raw glaze um, it's absorbed into the clay uh, a bit to, to which enables it to fuse together with the clay so that's the, another way that there's a fusion happening not just within the clay body itself and the molecules but also because the, the glaze on the top is actually a glass um, and it fuses with the clay um, at a higher firing um, so yes, you you have to do it in that sort of in that structure in that order, um, yeah. and um, but for me, you know, once it's in there, once I, once it's in the kiln, there's nothing more I can do. I just have to walk away and pray <laughs> to the kiln gods <laughs> that they find. <laughs> yeah, I think there's such a such an interesting correlation between the fact that, like, I mean, you literally just said it. You know, the 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 two materials have to fuse together to to get that end result and. In terms of the way that you create ceramics, so you have your piece and then you you have to fire it to an extreme heat in order to get the fusion to occur. I mean, come on, the similarity is like, it's, it's right there in front of you. And I think that's something that we we forget sometimes that there's there are so many similarities in in art and science and and they go hand in hand rather than a, a, at opposites. But um, that process of having to get those things to fuse together in such extreme heats as well is just such a happy link between the two, which I just think is makes me happy. <laughs> well, I agree. And even just on the creativity level, you know, it's yeah. the, it's the, the what if question, you know, the creativity that even made somebody think about 
you know, what if we created this plasma and could create energy and it be a solution for the, I mean, that, that is a creative decision. Um, you know, and, um, and I think that, it, you know, is at the heart of so many new innovations is there has to be that creative mindset to, to think of new ideas and new applications for things. Mm, yeah. Which would definitely go into a process of having to design a, a robot that you can put on it. How, Sarah, do you know how long the boon is? How long the articulated arm is? It's like 12.5 meters. Right. Okay. I know, <laughs> I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but do you know how heavy, <laughs> do you know how heavy mascot is? I can't. I think about 200, 250 kilos. I think. Right. Yeah. So it's, that's that a lot of weight <laughs> to put on the end of such a long arm as well. So again the creative solutions to come up with things like that and the the creativity in um in time to design a, a machine like that is just it has to be a creative mind and um, also just to mention quickly also the yeah. creative solution of putting robots into the vessel into a fusion reactor yeah <laughs> and this yeah. robots have been going in for like 20 years plus so imagine sometime in 1990s, somebody just, it just clicked or a light bulb just appeared on somebody's head. Oh, what if we put robots in? <laughs> <laughs> what about robots? <laughs> Everyone loves a robot. Um, and, and on that as well, with the creative solutions to things, sometimes, and one of my favorite things about mascot is sometimes it doesn't even need to be that creative. Like, you need a screwdriver? Well, look, we'll just stick a screwdriver on the end of it you know <laughs> yeah. you just adapt that so that mascot can pick it up you know sometimes they're, they're as simple as that um so with the um with the art competition in mind I know you were both judges for the art competition um which was so much fun to go through them with you and the theme of the art competition this year was focusing more on the sustainability of um how you can produce a piece of art be that the art itself representing something that is sustainable um, and also the interpretation of using sustainable items to create that art. So on that sort of thought process, I thought we could talk a little bit about the sustainability of fusion and the sustainability of the, the work that you do, Andrea, in ceramics. Um, now with fusion, obviously, once, once we have, you know, solved the, the, you know, answered the questions that we're still trying to answer about it, and we've made these fusion machines, it's going to be a really good way of getting our energy, which will be a more sustainable way than we are currently doing, you know, with fossil fuels. Um, but we do need to get to that point. And, you know, there will be resources used in order to get there. But once they're made, that's when it becomes a sustainable way of, of producing energy. And I feel like that's a similar thing to ceramics, you know, uh, the heat that you have to produced to, to to make it into a piece of ceramic um, might not be the most sustainable thing but once it's made the longevity of it is well, as long as you don't drop it it's uh, it lasts for a long time but you know I, I know you said that your sculptures are are, are thoroughly weathered um, in, in many different types of conditions uh, if you could tell us a bit, bit more about that, that. That's right. Um, I mean, essentially, th there are aspects of ceramics that aren't the most sustainable. Obviously, the, the materials are mined and, uh, you know, so the glazed materials, obviously the clay. But, you know, one of the things that before I get to the firing is that clay in at any state before it is fired can always be dissolved in water and reconstituted and used again. So there's very little wastage of raw clay. Um, and once it's been fired, um, even if I do have a disaster and something breaks or I've got lots of glazed with tiles, so test tiles and things, I always keep those and try and use them in another piece of art and do mosaics or other things. So I, I try and reduce the wastage very much. So, um, but I think that, um, you know, again, yes, the sustainability is in making um, a piece that will last quite a, you know, a long time. Um, and of course, the correlation really is the higher that you fire a piece to, the more, the tougher um, and longer lasting it will be, uh, because it will, it, there's a process called vitrification, um, which makes the, the piece less water, uh, more water resistant, less porous, um, and it will therefore stand, withstand all sorts of 
different temperatures and frost, uh, you know, high temperatures, low temperatures, frosts. Um, so I've taken pieces to Australia where they've been outside in 40 degree heat. And I've also had pieces here and I've had them for 30 years and they're still going strong. So it's, it is in that way, quite a sustainable um, medium. Yeah, as long as you don't drop them, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, oh. <laughs> one of those horrible moments. You're like, oh, oh dear. Whoops. <laughs> yes, I've had a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> Things exploding in the kiln, I can imagine as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you remember, I, I, you said as well, which I didn't actually realise, as to what an ancient practice ceramics is, um, and that it's been something that has just survived years and years and years this process of, of creating um well be it anything it you know obviously in your case it's sculptures but you know creating uh, bowls or cut uh, uh the word of it pots <laughs> vessels uh, bowls and pots and, and things <laughs> like that, that that just seems to be such an ancient practice which has continued for so many years which you know just proves that that it works um and that it is it does have longevity once it is in its final state um which is interesting because you know fusion is while well, we're still doing uh we're still working out how to really make it properly um uh contribute to our energy uh usage on earth it's it's a it's a process that's been taking place since the birth of stars like it's a very old practice <laughs> we're just trying to, to harness it here on earth um but yeah, I just think there's a nice there's a nice correlation between the two that they are quite both quite yeah, ancient things. Yeah, and it's great that they're finding out so much about history through finding ancient shards of pottery and stuff through excavations and things. So they yeah. they do survive a very long time, and it has been going on since probably six thousand BC. They've been making um, ceramic uh, work, so it is incredibly um, ancient sort of practice. And, it's and I mean, awesome. engineering in itself is a, we've been doing that since the <laughs> dawn of man, engineering different things to help us with, you know, either bit hunting or cooking or anything like that. Yeah. But um, back, going back onto the, the, the sort of point of uh, sustainability, um, the, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, you mentioned about the temperature which you need to fire um, the ceramics to. Um, and I thought it was interesting in our, our chats before you mentioned that you'd actually discovered recently that you don't need to fire it as hot as what you thought you used to. Um, That's right. I mean, the glaze that I, the recipe glaze that I've created, I'd always been, and there's usually with glazes, there's a sort of range that you can fire it to. Um, but up until um, about a year ago, I'd been firing it always up to 1260 degrees, which I thought was the, the, the you know, the optimum temperature to create the effect that I wanted. But um, purely through necessity, because of the kiln that I was firing it with, um, it was, wasn't my own kiln, but it was a fairly elderly kiln. Um, and the high temperature firings, do it does take its toll on the elements and the, uh, the, the components of a kiln. Um, and so uh, we did some tests and found that I that got just as good results at 1240. So I've been able now to fire my stuff at, you know, 20 degrees lower than, than expected, which is, is saving some energy resources and saving the poor elderly kiln as well. At the same time. <laughs> yeah, I think as well. So we, we talked about um, how technology and science and, and things like robotics and the building of machines like JET and Tokamaks and fusion machines um, is that as, as we develop as a, you know, as a species technologically and, and you know, get more, more knowledge about, about how to construct these things, we, when we advance in that area, we you know, find quicker and more efficient ways of building things to use less resource so I remember we were saying that you know I think the the more we learn the more sustainable we can become anyway whereas you know 50 years ago we might have been going through 10 or 11 stages to get to where we are now now we can go through four or five um I think the advancements you were saying the advancements in in technology do help to sort of cut that time down which does help to be more sustainable yeah that, that absolutely right 
and and if we even think about the jet vessel, um, yeah, like you mentioned, the jet vessel at the moment is not we can't really sustain the plasma for that long. But then with with the vessels, the tokamak and the research um, of ether and maybe demo, we would and and the advancement of all that we hopefully we'll be able to sustain the plasma for longer and then um, have a much more sustainable fusion energy. And the same thing with like robotics, as robotics keep advancing, um, who knows, maybe the next robot to go into maybe ETO demo can last a hundred years. That is pretty sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you can build something once to last for a long time, that's it's got to be better than building lots and lots of things over shorter periods of time and that's just yeah sustainability 101 <laughs> <laughs> there is one question in there um that maybe okay. Theo might want to answer or, or why do you use robotics to maintain the vessel to do maintenance in the vessel is it to avoid contamination uh so with the fusion reaction and the plasma it produces radiation and when it gets to sort of a level I think I'm not exactly sure of the numbers, but when it gets to sort of a level, it is harmful to humans. And so if we want to maintain the vessel with high radioactivity, it wouldn't be possible. Um, but then we can do that with robots. If that answers awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Right, I'm gonna see if we can click on. And here we go. So you should be seeing on your screens now, the Art of Fusion winners in each age category. Um, so for the 7 to 11 category, we had uh, Fusing by Poppy. Um, in the 12 to 17 character, ca character category, we had Nova by Hannah. And in the 18 plus category, we had Tokamak Tree by Bryant. Um, so congratulations to you three. And um, we will reveal the runners up uh, on the next slide. Um, there were so many excellent entries. So I thank you if you're watching, if you entered, there were, it was a difficult decision and there were a lot of amazing pieces of art really creatively thought through and a lot of them using really creative ways to make the piece uh, either sustainable or to represent sustainability and fusion, which we loved. Um, but yeah, so Sarah and Andrea, do you wanna just give us a little, a little rundown quickly of, of why or what you liked best about about these pieces um okay so for the first one i really like the orange color at the background but it reminded me of the sun and of course we know that fusion is the process of power of the sun um hmm. and then the two um pieces that look like um atoms coming together fusing together to form a bigger element um which is again fusion and and so it was it was really nice um there? yeah i love i love the also the texture of the piece as well um mm -hmm. and the fact that the piece was also made with leftover household materials so there was a really nice sustainability theme there and to me, I also felt, you know, that the images within the white outline was almost like a surprised face, which I kind of like, oh, yeah. because, you know, it's a little bit sort of, uh, you know, uh, an awe inspired face about the process of fusion, maybe. But I know I just thought it was very nice. And I, I really liked the colours were really striking. So move on to Nova by Hannah. Just such an interesting interpretation as well. I thought this was brilliant. So... Mm -hmm. What did you guys think? It was very clever because it's um it's by a thirteen year old um and the doll was made uh, was handmade along with all of the little pieces. Um, you probably can't see here now and because you can't zoom in, but even the necklace has got you know the elements of hydrogen and helium which are involved in the fusion process. So I thought it was just a very unusual um, and and very very cleverly made piece uh, and really unusual interpretation uh, of the of the brief. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, I, I particularly like the meta um, the mechanical design that the door took because again it kind of reminded me of robotics using robots to um, maintain the jet vessel or radioactive um, environment from fusion. So yeah. yeah, it was it was really nice. <laughs> Fantastic. And finally, talk about tree by Brian. I just I think this is a beautiful piece. I love that there's 
so many different people depicted in inside the actual vessel itself but over to you guys this one was my absolute favorite i have to say i just loved it because it had it had a kind of spiritual feel to it making the tokamak into the kind of tree of life symbol um and you know with this with the potential that it might offer us this sustainable energy solution you know a positive outcome for the world but I just thought it was visually very beautiful. Obviously, the sustainability factor is, is the fact that it's a digital piece. Um, but I also love the people in the foreground, the fact that it brought you know people from all different sort of walks of life together. And that to me was like an analogy of you know the fusion research that it being an international research project. Um, and um, and also I think the piece was a collaborative piece as well it was um done by a number a group of people so that was i really like that factor as well i'm gonna uh, oh sorry i was just gonna say everything andrea said <laughs> <laughs> second it i'm gonna move on and uh i'm i'm aware of the time i, I can never get these on time i'm so sorry um, i'm gonna move on and reveal the runners up and then i'll let them know uh what they're gonna be winning so i'll oh, come on computer our runners up are here. So we have Fusion of the Sun by Caroline. We have Blue Sky Thinking Reality Arriving by Paul. And we have Representation of Fusion by Francesca. Um, I just think these are wonderful. I particularly like the Fusion of the Sun, the use of petals and, you know, the most sustainable items that you could find that will, you know, probably by now be probably on, on the compost heap. Um, I just thought that was a really clever way of, of um, interpreting the brief, especially with the little solar flare up in the corner here. Um, but do you guys want to just give us a really quick rundown of each one as to what you liked best about them? And then we'll, uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up, see if we can answer any questions. <laughs> Well, I mean, you've already said about the fusion one, it was made entirely out of soil and petals and compostable materials so that um, basically the frame could be cleaned up and reused and all of the, the, the materials within it um, would be broken down and would leave no, no carbon footprint. Um, so, I mean, I loved it. I loved I loved the composition of it and I loved that feature. It just reminded me a little bit of sort of, you know, Aboriginal art, which used to be, they used to do sand paintings and, and it wasn't about creating a permanent piece of art, but it was about the process of making the art that was the most important thing. Um, and so I really liked that one. Okay. Theo? Um, yeah, we could clearly see um, the shape of the sun and the colours that of, of the petals that were used. Um, again, representing fusion. Um, the petals in the middle, we think of plasma, and then, um, like Andrea mentioned, the soil sustainability. So yeah, that's it was a wonderful work. And a couple of couple of quick comments on the last two, and then yeah. I'll have to uh, move us along. Yes, the blue sky thinking was just rather nice. I just I love the sort of image of you know plugging in the sun <laughs> to the machine to kind of <laughs> harness the energy. Um, <laughs> And I felt also the sort of texture of, of the background was to me a little bit reminiscent of sort of magnetic art that you can get sometimes. Uh, you know, yeah. So it reminded me of those sort of iron filing, sort of uh, that kind of texture. Um, and uh, the final one was a clever little bit of, of photography um, done using finger lights. Um, so the fact that it was a digital photography piece was obviously the sustainability um, um, factor. But Say, so, I don't know if you have any more to add. <laughs> uh, just on the blue sky thinking, the um, I, I really like the blue and purple bit um, that looks like it's circular in the middle <laughs> of the um, vessel because it reminded me of a jet vessel yeah. has like eight buttons. <laughs> um, so that was a really nice yes. representation of, <laughs> of fusion. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, then the, the finger lights, that was also a very brilliant, creative solution yeah. <laughs> and nice. really nice so yeah very good works well congratulations to our winners and runners up i will be emailing you tomorrow with details about the tour that you will receive as your prize um winners your pieces will also be turned into postcards for the um uka outreach team to use to promote fusion at events and uh, future festivals um and we'll also be displaying your artwork uh at a viewing in a gallery in Oxfordshire. And finally, just to remind you, 
there we go, just to remind you that there are other events that the UK AEA are doing for IF Oxford. So on the 21st of October at 6.30, it's the past, present and future of fusion energy in Oxfordshire. And on the 25th of October at 11 a.m. is BLAST. So do uh, get yourself signed up for those. And um, hopefully I haven't run over by too much. If you want to find out more, contact us on these. We're on social media um, or you can drop us an email to communications at ukaa.uk. Done. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Ella. That was a, a bit of a, a rapid run through at the end there. All that remains for me to do is to thank Ella, Andrea and Sayo um, for a really enlightening session. Who would have thought we could find so many analogies between art and fusion and engineering um, and science in general? So well done to all of you for finding all of those kind of collaborative and connecting um, themes between your different areas of work. But thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you good night, so everyone. much Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.